Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, our daily report uh, talk on the role of CDK46 inhibitor in early stage breast cancer. We have as panelists today Suzette de la Lodge from Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris, uh, Evandre de Zambuja from uh, Institut Jules Bourdet in Brussels, and Alex Pratt from Hospital Clinic in Barcelona. So we know that CDK46 inhibitors have strongly changed the way we treat the ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. We have now three approved drugs, namely palbocyclib, babemocyclib, and ribocyclib. Given the success these drugs have obtained in the metastatic setting, the obvious question is whether they can have a role in the early stage setting. There are four studies that have been looking at seeing whether these agents can be effective in the early stage by reducing the rate of invasive disease free survival. At the latest ESMO meeting, we have seen the results of two very important studies, the PALAS trial, which has resulted to be negative, and the monarchy trial, which, have result, which has resulted to be positive. So both studies have included uh, pre- and post-menopausal patients, uh, and uh, um, chemotherapy uh, was allowed, but it's not mandatory in both studies. The monarchy has included a population at a high risk, so at least uh, four positive nodes, or if patients had one to three positive nodes, they were required to have a T size of at least five centimeters or a grade three tumor or a KI67 of at least 20%. Patients in this trial were randomized to receive standard of care endocrine therapy plus or minus tabemacyclib for two years. At a 15.5 months of median follow-up, the two-year invasive disease-free survival was 90 2.2% in the experimental arm with endocrine therapy and abemacyclib versus 88.7% in the uh, control arm with endocrine treatment with an absolute difference of 3.5% and another duration of 0.74. So the relative risk of invasive disease were reduced by 25.3%. If we look at the secondary endpoint, the distant relapse-free survival, it goes from 90.3% with endocrine therapy uh, to 93.6% with the addition of abemacyclib with another ratio of 0.71 and a risk that is reduced by 28.3%. Going to the PALAS trial uh, regarding the population, actually uh, this included the patients with stage two and three early breast cancer. The trial randomized patients to receive either, either standard of care endocrine treatment uh, with uh, palbocyclib for up to two years or stand, standard of care endocrine treatment alone. 82.7% of these uh, um, patients received the uh, previous chemotherapy and then the median follow-up of 23.7 months, there are no differences in the three-year invasive disease-free survival nor in the distant relapse-free survival, which was a secondary endpoint as well. In the first plot, there are no differences between high and low risk groups. So now I want to start uh, uh, the discussion with our panelists. And I want to ask, uh, first of all, to Alex Brack, but of course, everybody is uh, welcome to uh, give his or her opinion if uh, he or she wants. So Alex, do you think that these differences may explain the different results from these studies? And if yes, uh, how? Hi, Carmen. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. I think we have more, more questions than, than answers after seeing the results from the two, two studies. Um, definitely there is some kind of disconnect between what we're seeing in the metastatic setting and, and early disease. Um, and this is, this is a fact. Uh, why is that? I think there are many open questions. I think on one hand, uh, the exposure of the patient to the drug is critical, I think. And I think we need to see more data regarding that. And this could explain in part why PALAS, the, there is no signal of, of efficacy. Uh, in any in any subgroup, knowing that 40% of patients stop ther therapy prematurely, I think this is a major issue that needs to be uh, well analyzed uh, to see. Potentially, we'll have additional results like Penelope B with one year of palbocyclic that once they read might help a little bit explain if this is a drug effect, if this is the lack of a drug effect, or, or what are the, the differences. So I don't have a clear answer to, to your question. Uh, Suzette, maybe you can uh, add something. Among all the possible reasons for the negative results of the PALAS trial, in your opinion, which is the most important? 
Well, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that there is um, a risk effect, meaning that uh, indeed the, the risk of the patients in PES was very different of monarchy. If you look, look at stage three, we're speaking about 48% stage three in PES versus 75% monarchy. There are also less grade three, et cetera. So, well, I'm still pretty convinced that part of the effect is some kind of uh, early metastatic phase treatment effect. So um, I would first need to have more follow-up on our monarchy to see what, what happens. Uh, indeed, in Palace, the initial trend was, was positive and it totally disappeared at, uh, at the three years of data we have now. So it's an interim analysis. It's, Palace has stopped for futility. We don't have much uh, follow-up, but the follow-up is is much uh, higher than monarchy. And if you look precisely at, at monarchy, what you, what you have is that um, the uh, two years, the IDFS is 88.7% in the standard arm, and it's exactly what we get at three years in past. So you see that the events uh, have one year delay between, between the, the, the two trials. So I think the effect is there. And it's exactly the same for DRFS. The, in the standard arm of monarchy, it's 90% uh, um, uh, uh, DRFS uh, at uh, two years versus we have 90% at three years in both arms in Palace. So I think uh, the effect of the drug uh, may be different. I'm not at all convinced of this based on what we have in the metastatic setting. I, I don't have uh, large clues to say that uh, Abemacyclib is so different of palbocyclib. I'm pretty convinced that the, the, the risk structure of the, of the patient population is, has a, an, an important effect here. And I'm also pretty convinced that the follow-up is very small in monarchy and that we, we need more follow-up to make sure that this is a, a real effect we are observing. Uh, going to the uh, safety profile of these drugs, uh, again, we are in a curative setting, so this is even more important than in the metastatic setting. Uh, Evandro, uh, may I ask which is uh, your thought on the safety profile of uh, these drugs in early stage breast cancer? Yeah, Carmen, uh, that's a very good question. The safety profile seems very similar to what you see in the metastatic setting, but indeed it's worrisome that in a metastatic setting, you don't see so many stopping treatment due to side effects, at least with the power cycle. We see a lot of dose reductions, but here we had 42%. In the bemacyclib, we see diarrhea that it has, is very common, 82% in all grades, and 7.6% in grade 3. So I think that is important to combine the side effects also with the quality of life, which you do not have any information at this moment. So I think I agree with what Alex said, I agree with what Suzette said, we have a different patient population, different risk, but also the safety uh, profile, how you can use the drug for two years or not using the drug interrupting early because of side effects, these play an important role in the efficacy that you see. Uh, like in the uh, palace, we had 13%, they were also not negative, so it's a much lower risk and there is something that is interesting to look not only in the risk, but in the endocrine therapy per se. Uh, if you look in the Monarch, 31% have been treated with tamoxifen alone, and 7.6% have been receiving ovarian function suppression. So you are treating a very high risk population, which may be a suboptimal endocrine therapy. And I didn't see in the forest plot how they perform according to the endocrine therapy. And this is to be interesting to see. Maybe as those patients with tamoxifen alone, that they are relapsing much earlier because they are much risk, much more risk, and they have a, a suboptimal treatment for endocrine therapy. That's another thing that. But this is always speculation. Huh? Yeah, of course, you're right. As uh, even Alex said in the beginning, uh, we have uh, more questions than answers uh, in this moment. Um, considering the positive results of the uh, monarchy trial, this is a question for all of you. Do you consider such treatment ready for prime time? Or would you consider, should it be um, 
approved? I don't think so. I th in my opinion, I would like to see, as Suzette pointed out, uh, more follow-up data to, to be sure that this is consistent uh, when patients are followed beyond uh, the 15 months, the medium follow-up that we have as of today. I think I would like to see that. Um, the benefit from an absolute perspective is not huge at this point, and there are toxicities as, as discussed. So I do think that I would like to see more follow-up. So again, let's see what the agencies uh, uh, state, but I do think that uh, a substantial proportion of patients do not benefit. Uh, it's just a, a small proportion. I think we need, we need more data to be sure that this, that this is the strategy. Well, I totally agree with that. And well, we definitely need to, to have more for up two years is, is very, very, Something very like that. And uh, um, beyond that, um, I think the, the risk benefit ratio needs, needs to be discussed. We are speaking here about 3%, 3% of something IDFS, DRFS. And this, this means a huge amount of, of patients uh, needing, needing to take two years of uh, I mean, as I can, uh, I'm not only speaking about the economical burden, but also the, well, I think uh, endocrine therapy is already something difficult to, to handle for patients uh, with a, a lot of adherence problems, etc. So we really need to think of what is the benefit we consider as uh, sufficient to propose this kind of treatment in uh, such a large amount of patients. Uh, based on the side effects we are, extra side effects we are uh, expecting. So, well, I, I think right now the, the 3% we have is, is uh, a bit small. Uh, I would love to have a bit more than this, but uh, I don't know what, what threshold we, we could uh, uh, put in this. I, I would have expected a little bit more. I, I hope that with more follow-up we will have more. I think the target was higher than uh, 3%. It was around 4.5 or something like that, which would be probably more meaningful. I totally agree with Alex and uh, Suzette. The follow-up is still very short, 15 months for a disease that can progress much later in the course is still short. And you have to, I agree, we have to look for quality of life, side effects, and the relapse rate. I think the 3.5%, 3.3% is still a minimal benefit. If you add all toxicity of the drug, if you add the costs, we have to add that as well because the, the treatments are getting more and more costly. So I think we are not ready to use to all patients yet. It might be in some patients very high risk, but not to all patients. We need to see how the regulatory agents are going to, to review that. But I would like to see really the quality of life of those patients. I think this is something very important. And one important thing is to ask it to all the patients, is the 3.5% meaningful to you? Yes or no? I think that's a, a good question. So, Evandro, uh, just to keep on following your um, latest uh, answer, I want to ask you, uh, and then uh, I will uh, pose the same question to uh, the other colleagues. Should a bemastic lib benefit be confirmed at a longer follow-up? Because it clearly emerged that the uh, follow-up we have so far is not 100% uh, uh, satisfying. Which are the most promising factors for patient selection? Because, of course, we cannot uh, thinking of uh, prescribing such treatment to all our patients. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Khan, because if you look at the subgroup that benefit the most, for me, is the high-risk population, four to nine positive lymph nodes. So I'm not sure that patients one to three, they shouldn't receive abermasically. Uh, we need to see how the regulatory agents are going to face this. And another thing that I mentioned in the beginning is another subgroup that benefit the most is the premenopause. And I come back to the discussion of the Novanex, the tamoxifen. Perhaps those patients have a suboptimal endocrine therapy and then that's why they relapse. The main effect here is not the abemasculin per se, but is a compensation of a suboptimal endocrine therapy. Would it be wise to have the same endocrine therapy to all premenopausal, postmenopausal, and then you could see the real effect of abemasculin? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point of view. It's interesting that bo both trials were open label. But, um, and well, you, you, you know this, this data we have published recently at Barbara Pistilin, Journal of Clinical Oncology regarding uh, young women and their adherence to uh, tamoxifen. And at three years, we have more than 35% of women 
who are not adherent to tamoxifen based on blood tests. So this is quite uh, impressive. And in the JCO, there were data from the Canto cohort showing that uh, there is a, a negative infect effect on a disease-free survival. So I think that that point of view has some interest. But uh, what I'm worried about is that both trials were open label. And despite this, in Palace, patients did not seem very motivated to, uh, to retain the drug with uh, so many dropouts. Uh, and 65% of, of them related to toxicity, but only 65% is not 100%. And um, I'm, I'm very uh, surprised also that there is so much difference between both trials. It looks like in monarchy, patients were much more motivated to, uh, to, uh, to keep the drug, maybe because they were higher risk, uh, more convinced that it was good for them. I have, I have no idea, but well, when you look at that, and when you look at those data we have in Canto, you just wonder whether we should not make additional efforts while developing this kind of uh, approach in the adjuvant setting towards uh, retaining patients' adherence. I mean, that's probably a, a, a very important part of it. That's definitely a, a fundamental part of the whole story. We, then, we have to bear in mind that tolerability and adherence are uh, very impo important factors uh, and uh, ultimately may affect the outcome of these patients. Uh, so Alex, uh, what about your ideal patient selection? I mean, it's hard at this point to, to really um... I mean, there's no signal. I mean, if you look at the forest plot, as Evandro pointed out, there seems to be quite substantial interactions. Uh, for example, if you look at, I have it in front of me, histological grade one, the estimate uh, even goes to the other direction. So, I mean, I think, I think that we have an heterogeneous population. Uh, again, the definition used in the trial is heterogeneous by definition. It's only based on nodal status and a few clinical variables. So I do think we need to do more effort in trying to dissect different populations. The high risk population within the monarchy study probably is the one to benefit the most, but I would like to see more data. The issue I see is that eventually if this gets approved, um, again, it's gonna be a subgroup analysis and it's gonna be very difficult to define who uh, we don't indicate or who we indicate this, this treatment strategy. And I think that's, that's the difficulty when you run this heterogeneous study without any pre-planned uh, analysis. One aspect I think that is critical is the biology of the tumors. Uh, we know ER positive or to negative is heterogeneously at the biological level. And for example, a variable as simple as K67 was not uh, shown here in monarchy. I would really like to see how the two groups, no, the ones with K67 above 20% and below 20%, although I think in the study 20% did not have K67 values, but I, I would like to see if the biology can help us further understand no, who's benefiting the most and put that variable as well on top of tumor burden, which is definitely important, but probably the biology of the tumors will also tell us uh, where, where these treatments need to be, need to be given. Alex, in this regard, do you foresee a role for genomic tests in uh, the identification of uh, uh, patients suitable for CDK46 inhibition in early stage? Of course, I will be biased here, but uh, yes, certainly yes. I do think we have tools no, that really tell can estimate much better the prognosis of patients and beyond just tumor size and nodal status that integrate biology. Again, just following my last comment, and there are now many tests validated that can really uh, help us better uh, estimate the, the risk without uh, a CDK4 and 6 inhibitor, and then be able to really make a better decision, I think, in the future regarding chemotherapy, of course, but also potentially CDK4 and 6 inhibition. It's also true that in these two studies, the vast majority of patients have received chemo. So in one hand, you're already selecting intermediate high-risk patients, uh, clinically speaking, uh, at least. And, and in some countries, they use K67 and some prognostic uh, uh, tools. So they're already selected uh, population. But even that, I think we will be able to, to better uh, dissect the uh, prognosis using this, this tool. So yes, definitely yes. Thank you. I think we have uh, almost uh, done with this talk. I think we have a couple of minutes uh, left. I just want a very uh, short answer uh, by each of you, uh, recalling uh, even a uh, large discussion. Uh, do you think that the differences of these trials uh, are uh, maybe expected? applicable by chance, by study designs, or by the different drugs used? 
Suzette. Um, I don't think it's chance. Sincerely for now, I don't think it's related to the drugs. I think it's, it's largely related to the patient's population, but also to retaining patients on treatment as well, uh, clearly, both. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's by chance. I think the drugs, they do work, but you have to select better the patients. It's a matter of patient selection and completion of treatment, adherence to treatment, those reductions and stopping early. The premature stopping of uh, palbuciclib may have compromised a lot the efficacy of this drug in the palace. So I completely agree. I don't think it's chance. I do think that the risk population is, that the population at risk is, is different on the two trials. And I cannot rule out that there might be differences in, in terms of the, the drug activity, especially in different subsets of ER positive HER2 negative. We don't have that data, but I think it'd be nice to at least have some studies to try to dissect if really abemacyclib and palbocyclib are the same from a biological level or not. Definitely, we don't have that. Uh, I don't suspect there are going to be major differences, but maybe there will be some surprises. Okay. So we are coming to the end. I really want to thank all our panelists, which provides, which provided us with uh, interesting uh, insights and thoughts on these studies. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the attendees, and I'm sure that uh, we will uh, keep on discussing about CDK46 inhibition in early stage breast cancer in the coming months. Thank you all.